can the, the comrades also come to the front? So brief questions, comrades. We only have 15 minutes of interaction and I'm trying, I'm gonna try to get uh, comments and questions out of you within 10 minutes and five minutes of replies from my panelists. Uh, it will be very difficult, but I'll have to manage that. Can I take hands? One, two, in that order, three, four, five. Is there any other hand I did not see? On Zoom, Comrade Irene, is there any? None. Okay, leadership. Thank you very much. My, my question is directed to Thomas. Um, um, m m the, the issue of, um, I mean, what, the role of central banks uh, in financing generally a just transition. And I, I hear the issue of public banks, but I, I'm of the view that obviously public banks uh, have got to be allocated some financing uh, through central banking. What is the role then of, what will be the role, the progressive role of central bank in terms of just transition? But largely in developing economies. Thank you very much. Much, comrade uh, Evelyn, Doctor Evelyn. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, comrade. I'll, uh, my my submission comes from the issue of broadening macroeconomic mandates beyond price stability. Now, the comrade talked about uh, increasing employment. Maybe we need to know how would increase employment how would the increase in employment translate to more availability of funding? Because that is going to be very important. And then to, it is also quite important to understand when you talk about uh, ISDSS, that is uh, Investor State Dispute Settlement Agreement, okay? What is the, um, at what point does um, the Just Transition Partnership actually bring them on board? Because that is going to be very clear. In what instances, you talked about the case of South Africa, what are the clear clauses in terms of that that might actually lead to the investor state dispute assessment uh, uh, within the WTO uh, uh, mechanism. And then finally, just to interest ourselves, maybe the comrades there should actually read about the ISDS uh, cases because Egypt is one of the countries that has actually had to pay 2 billion shillings for simply changing a policy in the interest of the public. So that even as we talk about it, as South Africa talks about it, then they should be able to understand why do we make this. Then finally, candidly, many of us in these rooms are not accountants. So next time when we're using a lot of big grammar, please take into account that some of us are not accountants. So turn it down in terms of submission. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, my, my first question is directed to uh, Comrade Bassani. Uh, it's in relation to what they need to fill um, the financing. <clears throat> so I just need some clarity because you spoke about, um, obviously, the Jet IP being um, 8 billion. And then uh, you said that there's a, there's a 97 billion of financing cap. So my understanding of that is that if we if we talk about a financing gap, then we are making the underlying assumption that we would have then taken the eight billion. And in terms of my understanding, the narrative uh, from 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 labor, from civil society, is that we're not going to take the eight the eight billion. So that all of the, the the ultimate financing will come from 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 the public, right? So uh, I just needed some clarity in 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 in, in terms of that. And then, no, no, just one last question. Uh, you also spoke about the bilateral investment uh, treaties uh, that, that are currently existing. You spoke about the fact that um, we have gotten rid of a lot of them, but there's still few in existence. Uh, my question is how far are we in getting rid of the few? Uh, how long will it take? And will this improve the situation insofar as the discussions are concerned? Thanks. I think it's it's comrade, yeah, yeah, it's you, comrade Dominic. Thanks, comrade. Um, I have two quick points. Um, the second kind of leads to a question. Um, the first comment relates to uh, macroeconomic constraints, and there I think 
over and above policy mandates in relation to price stability, we should also be cautious um, and wary of um, uh, the need for balance of payment stability, because this in itself entrenches a neoliberal economic framework and necessitates the need to raise um, the resources to finance debt service costs from increased financialization and of course export led growth models becomes at the expense of um, investments in local economies. But more than that, um, I think that we see uh, how this also leads to an ad additional point to your important presentation is that how it leads to high domestic market interest rates. Um, given um, the inequities within um, global currencies and the implications for um, currency stability. So I think these must be factored in. And I mean, in part, I wonder then, um, do multilateral development banks not represent similar threats as other international finance institutions? That's not to say that in principle, being against them, but I think it requires lots of work to transform it. And then I'm wondering, um, in terms of a triage system, is that the best immediate way to get finance, okay? And that brings me to my second point, which is um, in line with this idea of public-public partnerships. And I think one potential pool of finance that's missing from the conversation is the role of public pension funds and what they can potentially play in unlocking the resources needed for investment in infrastructure. And of course, by investing, for example, in the infrastructure for an energy transition on a public pathway approach could in fact have the multiplier effect of bolstering the pension fund to greater levels of employment within energy and the downstream industries. And you know, I just did a quick search to look at public pension funds in Africa, and this is where I end. And that is to say, they are not insignificant in size. Egypt, $6.2 billion, Ghana, $4.7 billion, Kenya, $13.7 billion, Namibia, $11.8 billion, Nigeria, $32.6 billion, South Africa, a whopping $110 billion. And most of these resources are invested in the financial economy and public workers often have some control over where these investments go. Is this not part of what we need to advance in terms of a public pathway approach, public-public partnerships? And should we not do a bit more research on what potential pools of finance are within public pension funds, what they are currently, what the investment mandates are, and if they can be potentially redirected to investing in a kind of green industrialization program um, as opposed to a green structural adjustment program that we're seeing now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, just listening to the experience in South Africa was coming up in Senegal, what the comrade from Indonesia spoke about. Um, I think this would be a good space to try to get a collective response on the just transition or just energy transition partnerships, which are basically taking the same model to every country. And we're already finding that the trade unions share a very similar perspective, but so far at the global level, there hasn't really been a critical voice on behalf of the union movement talking about this. So just a suggestion, is this something that we can work towards? getting members from the countries that are being affected directly with the support of all the other ones to say, why not? Or what kind of energy partnership we want, let's say. But uh, I think the, the coincidences between your presentations are there. And I just think it would be good to take it to the next step, which would be trying to bring it more to, to the public sphere. Thank you very much. Um... We have five minutes indeed. Oh, there are hands. Okay. One, two, three, four. Uh, Comrade Irene, this will uh, interfere with the time you gave me. 
we'll just extend. We're left with four minutes on the time you allocated. And why don't we go till uh, 12 and then the next session has 50 minutes and then, yeah, okay. Thanks. One minute each. One minute, brother. One minute. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Chair. My question will go to uh, Comrade Dr. Busani Baloyi um, around uh, the macroeconomic policies uh, and the implications that the loans have on, on, on the macroeconomic policy. Uh, you you talked on how the loan conditions are not stipulated and those conditions impose some sort of restrictions to our macroeconomic policies. And as a result, countries are forced to practice some financial stability or financial prudence uh, in, in order for them uh, to maintain some kind of stability within, um, the, um, within their economy. But now, the issue is that maintaining financial prudence comes with a lot of impact on our macroeconomic policies, such as increased unemployment rate, issues of lack of investment on our public services, um, poor health uh, services, collapsing health, uh, actually health um, uh, sector, and, um, and issues of lack of housing, for instance. So all these public services are affected as a result of countries having to maintain this financial prudence or stability, that then results to an, an economic instability. Now, the question is how are these um, institutions, financial institutions then benefiting from a country that has a collapsing economic economy as a result of them being forced to actually maintain this financial prudence that uh, have been imposed in these loans that um, they get um, uh, granted. Um, yeah, let me yeah, yeah, let me end it there. Thank you. Comrade Sean will be the last and can help uh, assist in answering. Comrade Andile, and then and then. Just a general question for the panel. Um, how do we bring our critique of the Jet IP into the public sphere? Specifically, if we're trying to get people mobilized in resistance to this green structural adjustment, a lot of the language in the JET IP is to most people confusing, jargony, and on the other hand, public power utilities um, across the continent are ailing. So if we're trying to mobilize people, how, what kind of political language are we going to use to get people to understand what the JET IP is and why it needs to be resisted. Thanks. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je ne serai pas long, mais oui, hier, uh, par rapport à le, le cas de la Chine, je me suis dit uh, au niveau du Sénégal, nous sommes trop, trop en retard. Et ceci, pourquoi et comment on va faire? Nous devons nous lever, nous les syndicalistes, la société civile et tout le monde pour échanger, discuter, surtout sur les contrats, en signant les contrats avec les, euh, la Banque mondiale, la FMI, la BAD. Il faut que les syndicalistes soient présents dans ces comités pour qu'on sache exactement qu'est-ce qu'on signe. Et les dettes, la dette sénégalaise est énorme. Et comment on va faire pour euh, effacer cette dette. Et alors que nous sommes un pays très riche en matière, en énergie renouvelable, je vais en parler demain, mais euh, toujours je me dis pourquoi, comment on va faire pour que le Sénégal aille en avant. Et alors que dans euh, l'IMOA, le Sénégal fait partie des de premiers pays en matière énergétique. 
Et jusqu'à présent, on est toujours endetté, hein, toujours endetté. Donc, nous devons travailler en tant que syndicalistes euh, sur, sur tous les contrats signés par la Banque mondiale. Merci beaucoup. R really quickly, and I, I think this will probably, we should flag this for the final day when we talk about next steps. But I would like to suggest that in the room we have, in a sense, Indonesia, we have Senegal, and we have South Africa, with the three principal countries other than Vietnam. We don't have union contacts in Vietnam yet, although we are working on that. Remember, the trade union movement is structured differently in the Vietnamese context. Um, but there is a fight going on within the Vietnamese Communist Party over this issue of liberalization and jet peas, which we are aware of. So I suggest that we have a small group, a meeting between the Senegalese comrades here and the uh, comrades interested in the jet, fighting the jet pea, the financial dimensions, and, and also um, link up with Andy in Indonesia. Maybe we can have a small caucus. On that similar point, I think we should also flag the idea of a subgroup working on alternative finance within Chuet South, because there's some knowledge now in the room that wasn't in, in the room in Nairobi, who really know these issues. And I think um, and with, with comrades like Tom uh, willing to help, and he's often extended his offer, we can do that. So I think we should also consider that as a possibility. And I think that somewhat addresses Andile's issue he raised a very good point. We can oppose stuff, but what's our alternative? And if we can expedite the development of our alternative in a way that can get into the public discourse, then that's why we set up this project, is to begin to provide an answer to what is being proposed. Because otherwise, we'd just be seen as complainers who've got nothing else to say. And Last point on this, and it'll come up in the later in sessions today, there are cracks in the multilateral system that are very deep now over the question of global public goods, sustainable development, massive cracks, and really questioning the whole structure of the role of the international financial institutions from within the international financial institutions. So they're not a monolith, and I think we should make those cracks wider. So let's talk about that in future sessions. Thanks, comrades. Thank you very much. Uh, let me give to Comrade Basani, and then uh, I, because I think questions only pose to two, Comrade Thomas and Comrade, and you have a loaded. Just to say um, thank you to my fellow panelists. It was it was amazing uh, listening and hearing about your your context. Um, so the the first question around um, broadening the the macroeconomic framework, increasing um, increase in de, uh, in employment uh, uh, as part of the ma the macroeconomic mandate. How do we raise more funding towards this? So. Basically, the central bank has a mandate, right? Um, which is around ensuring price stability, like ensuring that there is no inflation and also ensuring financial stability. And part of that financial stability to my comrade Dominic would be balance of payments as well, right? So it's all encompassing of what we mean by, by, financial, uh, by financial stability. The, the issue for us is that why don't we broaden that mandate, right? So that whatever the operations that the central bank does, which is buying and selling of bonds, for instance, from like, or, um, or issuing currency or um, setting of interest rates, that in so doing, it needs to ensure uh, uh, it, it needs to do those operations by uh, through another mandate, which is ensuring full employment, right? Meaning, if we are in a if we are in a crisis of unemployment, 
right? And the central bank's mandate is around employment creation. Then the lowering of interest rates to ensure that companies can invest because now you've reduced the borrowing costs, the costs of financing becomes key and you, 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 you decrease interest rates in order to stimulate the economy in that way, right? Or you issue, you have stimulus packages uh, uh, by pumping money into the system. Am I too long? Okay, pumping money into the system, uh, but directing it, ensuring that it's directed towards infrastructure projects or, or other types of uh, employment creating um, uh, activities. That is what a, a central bank that has a mandate around employment creation has uh, does. The same can be said about if it has a green mandate. It means that it will use whatever instruments that it has in its toolkit to ensure that it makes adjustments, it creates money or whatever in a way that supports the, the achievement of that mandate so that it's not just around inflation targeting. So that's, that's what was meant um, by that. The, the question around JIP financing gap. So that was a way I was basically responding to the JIP. So there's 8.5, and, and maybe I didn't phrase this properly. There's 8.5 billion um, uh, of committed financing, right? That has been committed to via de-risking strategies. And for that, we say that they, through this approach, there are a range of risks, right? That that whole thing entails. And therefore, it's, it, in its current package, it's not to be accepted. There is the ambition, right, by these very partners or to have 8.7 billion, 98.7 billion or whatever it is. The question that is, can you raise that money via de-risking, right? Can you? The answer is no, right? Because of all the reasons I stated right? You will struggle to do so. You can de-risk and de-risk as much as you want, right? Create avenues of, uh, and, and which is why even through this de-risking, the scale of financing historically has not come to the multilateral finance. It hasn't, right? There, there is this understanding that we are not meeting our climate ambitions as much as we want, but the climate needs are, 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 are humongous. The question then is that what kind of global financial architecture is in operation that is blocking the mobilization of that financing, number one? And within that, how does that, it, that sh then shape the, the, the ma macroeconomic policy frameworks of countries so that it makes it, it, it then they become constrained in doing so? And, and, and because it hinges on de-risking, you won't meet those those um, those you will you will not reach the scales but when you even if you get some money the costs of that are high that's the challenge thank you uh there were a range of others but i don't have yeah, time we don't have time i have to be strict sorry sorry we'll talk more we already terminated into the more fun here. yeah it is but i agree with you on pension funds <laughs> they also need a mandate such as public banks, such as central banks. They all need a mandate and to operate. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Corporate Thomas, uh, one minute. One minute, strictly. <laughs> one minute. Okay, I will be concise. I agree with everything on central banks. I would emphasize that central banks can play a progressive role in fostering public public collaboration with public banks as a matter of policy. But more importantly, getting out of the way in terms of democratic governance of domestic public banks, which they often uh, block, particularly union representation on domestic public banks. Uh, in terms of the MDBs and multilateral development banks, a lot of work to do there. I would say, though, a disproportionate amount of attention has been given to the MDBs. They are important, but national and subnational public banks 
are far bigger, have far more res resources, and are far more connected to the local level. And um, in terms of like the language around just energy transitions, I would point to the public banking movement in the United States. They've done an amazing job of reaching out and connecting the question of public finance and the creation of public banks to marginalized, underserved, and racialized communities, particularly around just energy transitions. Um, and then uh, two, two final points, the question of pension funds is fraught. I would point towards the Canadian Union of Public Employees uh, that you might want to connect with them. Uh, it is a huge issue and there's a huge problem because the pension funds are profit oriented. And so they pushed the mandate of the Canada Infrastructure Bank to be profit, to be private, uh, about mobilizing private finance for profit. There is an important job and work to be done on linking those. Finally, just a note, uh, Sean, in terms of Vietnam, I'm actually doing some work uh, with UNDP and UNCTAD and Vietnamese government on the creation of a new Vietnam climate bank um, and some interest around that. And there are tensions and that needs to be explored and a pro-labor, pro-public vision on that needs to be um, emphasized and uh, to make these as a hub of expertise for the public sector by and for trade unions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the end of our session. Thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, we couldn't manage the only enemy here is time. Um, we will, of course, find time during the course of the day and tomorrow to discuss even further. Thank you very much. So can my comrades please take the stand because come and sit because the longer you take, the longer we're going to get to lunch. In the language that you want to listen in, it will be very clear coming through the headset. Noel, is your session? Yeah, I think, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, is is Tuana is here? Tuana, Tuana. Where's Mahangora? Oh, here he is. Who's Tuana? I mean, where's Shatang? Tuana here. Tuana. Oh, you're Tuana. Oh, great. Okay. Facilitating the session, I think. What what has been quite interesting thus far um, in the sessions is that we've been listening to the challenges that we've been confronting by, as communities and trade unions. What's interesting about this session is that we're going to have the opportunity to really think about, and I think it it speaks to Comrade um, Andile's point: How do we actually start articulating for a public pathway, noting that there's so many challenges. And I'm hoping that from each of the presentations, comrades are going to be a lot more practical. Um, I think what I am seem to be missing, and I think, uh, Comrade Bruno, your point um, was something I was actually going to start with. Where is the articulation of our just transition pathway? And I want to be a bit provocative to with Sean. I don't think we need, the alternative is there. We were the alternative as the public sector. The point is what they're presenting is the public as the private sector as the alternative because of certain conditions within the public sector. So I think we, we should be in some ways proactive because we don't want to be on the defensive. I think the answers are there and the fact that many times after privatization, we go back to the public sector. 
means that the public sector is the answer. We need to be articulating what are the agendas. I think what's also coming through quite substantively, and again picked up by Bruno, your point about how similar the, the challenges are, regardless of which country you're going to and which part of the continent, if it's happened in Latin America, it then goes to Asia and then it comes to Africa. And the fact that we continuously as developed and developing countries fall into the same trap, repeating the same processes. I mean, it's almost as if, when they talk about us being part of a global village, when you listen to the stories, it's, it doesn't matter which country you're in, the story seems to be the same. It's how do we as labor, civil society, and those who are contesting actually get our act together in the same way that those are, that are confronting us are, are, are doing. So we need a really formidable contestation. So with those words, let me hand over to Comrade Sean, who I think I know no, needs no introduction. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm going to well, condense what was a plan to be a longer presentation into a very short one, uh, because some of the issues will come up later. Um, I'm going to refer you to the description in the program because I think it it sort of covers what I um, what we we need to discuss at this point, and that basically is what we're seeing globally is some kind of impromptu reclamate reclaiming of energy systems by governments, and it's usually done in context of crisis. Uh, obviously, the Ukraine war led to massive increases in prices which completely threw the electricity markets into so much chaos, the price increases were phenomenal. And governments intervened both with price protections for end users, but also in the case of countries like Australia, they actually decided to abandon the uh, wholesale markets in electricity. So the question I pose or we've posed in the program, the organizers of the, if you like, Chuet, um, is how do we turn these impromptu rec reclaiming initiatives, let's call them that, into something that is coherent, in other words, the public pathway? How do we use this moment and try to connect? You have, and the question is, how do unions um, offer that coherent answer that can cut across um, all the different situations internationally where this is happening? So I'm going to put up a few slides. You can see this first one um, is the um, just a, this is really more a segue into the discussion. This is the Overseas Development Institute. It basically crunched the numbers. All of this is in the framing document, by the way, about how little money has been mobilized by blended finance. The whole idea was, as we discussed in the previous session, Billions to trillions. That was the World Bank. Billions of public finance would mobilize trillions in private sector. It was never explained what the mechanism was. Why would public money put on the table match be matched many times by private money? It's never been explained. And the more you look, the harder it, it is to find the explanation. So this, I think, is beginning to fuel the, our alternative. Now, I want to go back a bit in history. Next slide, please, Irene. This picture was taken um, 11 years ago, I think, you know, 10 or 11 years ago in Johannesburg at NUMSA. NUMSA organized this conference, Renewables Too Important to be Left in Private Hands. So the, the, the beginnings of the discussion, and it was very, very superficial, no criticism of, of NUMSA. Everybody in the room, we're struggling with what does that mean, social ownership of renewable energy? It's still in the discourse, but there's lots of disagreement. There's not a lack of clarity, even in the South African context. And that the, the lack of clarity is across the progressive movement internationally. Some people believe in local solutions. They think local energy is better than reclaiming uh, energy to full public control. We've had those debates in many national contexts. I can't summarize them adequately here, but we need to be clear as Chewed South where we stand on the whole renationalization discussion. This is the development platform of the Americas that was started in 2012 and has been updated since. This is the Trade Union Confederation of the Americas, um, which is the all of the national affiliates to the International Trade Union Confederation in the plan of the document referred to returning energy to public control. It didn't really go into too much detail what that meant, but it was there and it was another step in the right direction. 
Next slide, please. We heard from Comrade Sung Hee and, and that about the efforts on the, on the, the, the Korean trade unions to uh, uh, advance publicness as an alternative to the privatization model in Korea. And that work too has progressed and become more nuanced, more granular, and more convincing, I think, in terms of the public appeal. Next slide, please. PSI, I can, I think PSA comrades will forgive me if I say this. 10 years ago, PSI did not support renationalization. It opposed privatization, but it didn't say we need to take the stuff back that has been privatized and marketized. Now they are supporting the public ownership and reclaiming of energy. That's a big step forward. That's a large trade union body. So we support that transition. Next slide, please. We saw it was a brief moment of hope. This is Rebecca Long Bailey, the shadow minister for energy. No. Oh, okay. This is Rebecca Long Bailey, the shadow minister for energy. We worked very closely with her on plans to, of the Corbyn government, if it was elected, the Labour Party in the UK, to renationalize the energy system. Our intervention there as CHUED, I think, was particularly significant because the original document proposed by the Labour Party was very influenced by the German Greens, the idea of community energy, that that was going to be the model. Um, we don't need to renationalize. We just need to let communities generate electricity. And it was preposterous in terms of, or in its naivety was unbelievable. But I forgive them because 10 years ago, I would have probably said the same. And I think there's a lot of people had illusions with the German energy model and not seeing its limitations. Um, Labour didn't get elected, as you know. So um, it, uh, we got the Tories in power, et cetera. You know the story. But the work was done in terms of convincing the Labour Party that we needed comprehensive reclaiming of privatized energy, and that became unanimously adopted by the Trade Union Congress in the, in the autumn of 2019, just before COVID. Next slide, please. We saw in 2020 a ferocious battle in France to, for, to get, um, um, uh, to stop the private, the further marketization of the national utility EDF. Macron was for, forced to back down and that was basically a partial but very significant victory. It wasn't just the campaign. It was, I don't even need five minutes. It wasn't even, it wasn't the campaign. It wasn't just the, the, the campaign that was successful. It was that the French uh, CGT, the FMN, 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 the Mining and Energy Union in France produced a, 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 their progressive vision for energy, which included a commitment to decarbonization, Yes, it was pro-nuclear. We would expect that in France with the energy unions being heavily involved in nuclear. But they took the position and they said, we need a progressive energy vision. And we've been working closely with the CGT France uh, since the, that moment. And they have came to the founding meeting of Chued South in Nairobi. Next slide, please. This is recent. Um, so, as I said, in the UK context, renationalization was killed off with the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Um, a new leader comes in, Keir Starmer. He's all over the place, completely confused on what to do about the energy crisis. And this is the largest union in the UK and probably the second or third largest union in Europe, Unite, urging Starmer, if he's elected and they have a big lead in the opinion polls, to renationalize energy. So it's in the discourse. Next slide, please. This is going back again to Chewed's contribution. In 2021, we convened a global trade union task force for a public energy future. We got a big document that's just about, well, I say just about, maybe in the next few months will come out, which talks about the role of a reclaimed public utilities and what they would do similar to what they used to do in terms of energy planning and delivery, in a public goods mandate, but also what they would do differently in terms of pivoting more towards energy efficiency and conservation. So this is also part of the discussions on reclaiming uh, power companies to public ownership. Is what would they do different? What the new mandate would look like? Next slide, please. I'll skip the next few slides, Irene, if you don't mind. Um, 
I'll go to the ESCOM final form slide, the next one. Okay, this was, I think, a significant document. This is now three years old. We did with AIDC, Transnational Institute, where it looked at the real crisis of neoliberal policy, the failure of uh, um, the energy privatization, and the need for a new ESCOM that would be armed with a new mandate. Very difficult message to sell in the South African context, given the purported and real, probably, corruption of the, of the utility and the mafia and the gangsters who were inside it that were brought in as part of the privatization and marketization efforts of the ANC government back in the 2000s. So they blame it on a public entity, but it's the private actors in those public entities who are basically causing the damage. So there was a, this was a good, I think, contribution to the renationalization and the reclaiming discussion. This a picture, we've got Comrade Martin is in this picture. I'm very proud of this little shot I took um, of him. This was a, a NUM workshop on the public pathway to a just transition, which NUM adopted at its Congress a year ago. Next slide, please. Now, back to the crisis and the opportunities of the current period. This is much more recent. Um, what we're seeing now, I've seen in the, in the South African press, there's been talk about the Vietnam model is to solve the problem of load shedding. And it's a complete misrepresentation of what's going on. It said, Mark Swilling, I hope you're listening, that eight gigawatts of power was added in one year and basically has solved Vietnam's energy problems. Wrong. Vietnam has canceled its feed-in tariff with solar. It's pared down its, its goals in terms of offshore wind. And it's questioning whether its grids have been, or it's recognizing that its groups have been almost fatally compromised by the input of variable renewable power without planning, without an upgrading in the infrastructure. The Vietnam model is a model of a failure of neoliberal energy policy. So please, comrades from South Africa, check it out, work with us to answer some of these claims that are being made in the media by the friends of the renewable energy multinationals. Now, this is Fitch Rating Agency, purchased a report in June 2022, that now suddenly realizes that state-owned enterprises are key to the energy transition. That's after they spent 30 years undermining state-owned enterprises and making them financially insolvent. But, and this is true of the discussion we'll have this afternoon, the World Bank has also acknowledged that the poor utilities have no money and they are financially unviable. So they have to, guess what, de-risk, or we have to de-risk private investment so they can get their liquidity back. It's absolutely comical, the policy, but it shows, again, the recognition that there is a big problem in the, in the current policy. Next slide, please, Irene. And we've seen, and we referred to it yesterday, Uganda to nationalize electricity utility, because the, what we're seeing again is these occasional moments of, of reclaiming that we need to turn into something bigger, something more inspiring and something clearer, I think. Next slide, please, Irene. Even Honduras has challenged and canceled its independent power producer program and guess who jumped all over the Honduran government? The US State Department under our friend, Joe Biden, decided he was gonna threaten a government like Honduras with the investor state dispute mechanism uh, procedures that were, that were um, are on the books. Honduras though has not backed down as far as I know on this subject, on this issue. Next slide, please. I don't know what this one is. I've forgotten Ghana. Thank you. I can see now. Yeah. Similar, similar uh, chose to pay. I think um, I may be wrong about these numbers. The Ghanaian comrades will help me. Something like $450 million in compensation to independent power producers in order to get out of contracts that would have cost them one and a half billion dollars. Again, this is a um, sign of the IPP system being resisted, albeit sort of unconsciously and on a piecemeal basis. Next slide, and I think this might be the, I got two or three more slides and I wanna focus just a little bit in the one minute I think I have left, which is on Mexico. Um, I don't know if comrades have been able to follow this, but the Mexican government was elected on renationalization of energy. That was one of the main issues. Four years ago, uh, Morena, a new party on the scene in Mexico, 
won 60% of the vote, has got now, the president has 80% popularity, which is kind of phenomenal in Mexico, attacked by the right wing, not just domestically, but internationally for violating the principles of the free market and of being reinstating the national utility as the primary energy producer in Mexico. Now, what Mexico has also done is it's just recently, this came out yesterday, so I won't spend time on it now, but it's hugely significant. It sat, it, first of all, it fined Iberdrola, the Spanish multinational, for basically violating a Mexican sort of laws on an energy provision. I don't know the details, but then it sat down and bought out the, um, the assets of Iberdrola. So it's a renationalization, yes, with compensation, but the government has reclaimed the um, reclaimed that the a very important part. It's something like eight gigawatts, I think, of production. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of public pathway approach to energy transition, next slide, please, Ari. What we've seen Mexico do is a lot of a lot of the left, including unfortunately the environmental, a lot of the environmental groups have basically criticized the government in Mexico because of its cancellation of renewable energy contracts, saying, oh, you just want to go back to oil and gas. You want to go back to the old fossil fuel-based economy. I don't think it's true, but I don't think it's false. I think we should be, this is where we come in as unions and we're working with Mexican comrades to try to put forward this position. This is the largest public solar park in Latin America. It's going to, it's, it's 400, uh, megawatts it's going to be 1.1 gigawatts and it's public between the federal government and the state of sonora in mexico mexico has also upgraded its hydroelectric systems so it can produce more renewable energy and it says it remains committed to its climate targets under the paris agreement again we're not trying to say that mexico is a model just as yesterday we weren't trying to say china is a model but these are signs i believe comrades that Renationalization can become a, a trend in world policy, and it also can be supported by unions, but we have to make sure it goes beyond piecemeal defense of public energy or even minor extensions of public energy into a full-fledged, full reclaiming of energy in order to set the stage for a public pathway approach to an energy transition. So I'll stop there with those thoughts. Thank you. I don't think you must because this is the most powerful presentation in terms of us taking inspiration. These are struggles that are actually contested. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Too much sooner. I don't think you were listening. This was the most powerful presentation in relation to contestation. Amandla! So can we share the enthusiasm even though lunch is on its way? And, and, if, and if Irene, I think if, you know, I'm placing the respondents under pressure with 10 minutes each, but perhaps if we can either come back earlier from lunch, but I think it would be absolutely important for engagement to happen. It's just not gonna happen in the 30 minutes when I've got three respondents. So that's just food for thought. Okay, so may I hand over to my comrade from Benin to, to respond. The floor is yours, 10 minutes from. Merci, salut camarade. Alors, je me présente à vous, c'est Noël Chadaré. Je suis le secrétaire général de la COSI Bénin, la Confédération des organisations syndicales indépendantes du Bénin. Une confédération, une création syndicale représentative. Et donc, je, je dois dire un merci à Tued parce que Tued nous offre une opportunité de nous retrouver dans ce cadre si prestigieux avec de, de, de grandes personnalités pour participer à ces échanges qui sont riches, très riches et enrichissants pour nous. Et ça, il faut le dire parce que depuis hier, ce que j'ai appris, j'ai beaucoup appris. Je vous remercie pour nous avoir invités à cette occasion. Et on espère qu'on en redemande encore des, des, des occasions comme celle-là. Alors, l'autre chose que je peux dire, c'est par rapport au Bénin, le pays, c'est un petit pays. Euh, il est un petit pays limitrophe du Nigeria. 
Grand Nigeria, on est frontalier du Nigeria, avec le, le Burkina Faso, le, le Niger et le Togo. Ce sont les pays avec lesquels nous sommes l'Afrique de l'Ouest. L'Afrique de l'Ouest, c'est un pays de 114 760 km et avec environ 13 millions d'habitants, 12 millions 900 et quelques habitants. Donc voilà un peu. Et dans cette société, dans ce pays, espace, on n'a pas parlé, on ne parle pas de dénationalisation parce que le, la société qui gère, qui produit, et transporte et distribue l'énergie, c'est la société béninoise de l'énergie électrique, une société d'État. Société d'État qui a survécu à la dénationalisation parce que le Bénin a connu une période de marxisme-léninisme jusqu'en 1989, 17 ans, et c'est tout était nationalisé. Et, et quand est arrivé le pouvoir, le pouvoir libéral, eh bien, on n'a pas, pas dénationalisé parce qu'on a estimé que c'était, n'est-ce pas, euh, une société très, très importante. Il ne fallait pas vendre l'électricité et le, le privatiser. Donc, il est resté dans le giron de l'État. Quel est l'État de quelle est aujourd'hui la situation de cette société dans la distribution de l'énergie C'est de ça que je vais parler un peu maintenant. Eh bien, nous allons vous dire tout simplement, comme à l'instar des autres pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, il y a une dépendance, la société béninoise de l'énergie a une dépendance énergétique vis-à-vis -vis du Ghana, du Nigeria et de la Côte d'Ivoire. 90%, n'est-ce pas, de l'énergie consommée au Bénin vient de ces trois pays. Donc, le Bénin ne produit très, très peu d'énergie. Il y a un barrage hydroélectrique qu'on appelle le barrage de Nagueto, n'est-ce pas, qui est, que nous avons en commun avec le Togo et qui, n'est-ce pas, produit l'énergie hydroélectrique. Et nous avons aussi hein, le, la centrale thermique de Maria Greta, c'est ce que le Bénin, les sources de production, n'est-ce pas, d'énergie de la SBE. Alors, le réseau, donc il y a cette dépendance, et ensuite le réseau de, de distribution de l'énergie électrique qui est, qui est obsolète, complètement dépassé, euh, l'énergie conventionnelle, je veux dire, est complètement vêtu ce réseau parce que et bien, il y a parfois la grande partie de ceux qui sont qui sont branchés qui ont l'électricité sont mal branchés ils sont mal branchés donc le taux de l'électrification en milieu rural est de 5% contre 56,5% en milieu urbain, alors que 60% des ménages vivent en milieu rural. Donc, donc nous avons quelque part euh, cette situation qui montre que euh, c'est comme un peu ce qui se passe dans les autres pays. Et, alors, dans les ménages, euh, on recourt au bois, le bois énergie, à plus de, de 59,4% de la consommation nationale. Donc, le gaz domestique n'est pas une, une réalité pour, pour tout le monde. Très peu de familles ont, c'est un privilège, le gaz domestique, parce qu'il coûte encore cher. Alors, face à cette situation, le Bénin, le, le gouvernement du Bénin actuel, n'est-ce pas, dit qu'il faut euh, entreprendre des réformes, hein, des réformes qui sont en vue. Et la société béninoise de l'énergie électrique euh, va, être, euh, pas, va avoir seulement le rôle de distribution de l'énergie et il y aura deux autres sociétés. Il y a deux autres sociétés qui sont en train d'être mises en place. Une société pour produire l'énergie et une autre société pour, n'est-ce pas, transporter l'énergie. Et puis, la société binoise va, n'est-ce pas, va distribuer l'énergie pour rendre un peu plus efficace, n'est-ce pas, le, 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 la distribution de l'énergie conventionnelle. Mais il faut retenir en résumé que le, la production énergétique est en deçà, en deçà, largement en deçà des besoins de, cons de consommation, que ce soit euh, dans, dans, le, par le tissu, dans le tissu industriel, hein, les ménages les, en ville, comme dans les zones rurales, c'est largement en deçà la, la, la consommation. Donc, la trans la, 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 alors, c'est donc une occasion. Euh, on voit que le terrain, c'est un dans notre pays, c'est une terre en friche. Hein, la grande partie des populations n'ont pas l'énergie. Donc, c'est une, une occasion formidable de prendre, de profiter de cette, trans, de cette transition énergétique pour que l'énergie puisse aller dans tous les coins et tous les recoins. 
Et donc, le gouvernement béninois, n'est-ce pas, est, a commencé, s'est engagé depuis quelques années dans l'accès aux, aux équipements photovoltaïques. Photovoltaïques, hein, parce que euh, nous devons dire que notre pays dispose d'un fort potentiel d'énergie renouvelable, fort potentiel. Hein, et, et le, le soleil il brille terriblement. Il y en a des, parfois de certains endroits, vous avez 40, 45 degrés, 40 degrés de, de chaleur. Et nous avons des, 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 des ressources hydrauliques aussi. Et donc, tout cela, c'est quand même un potentiel important au niveau de notre pays, le Bénin. Donc, le, 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 le gouvernement est donc allé dans cette direction de faciliter un peu les équipements photovoltaïques. Et plusieurs acteurs se sont mis là-dessus pour faire le travail, pour faire le job. Mais il faut reconnaître que malgré cela, c'est que le, le coût de ces, de ces équipements photovoltaïques n'est pas accessible à tout le monde. Et ça fait que ce n'est pas encore euh, la bonne, c'est certes la solution, mais les moyens, il manque. Donc, vu l'immensité de la tâche, le challenge sera très difficile pour notre gouvernement, le pays, de se... De, se, de réaliser dans un moyen terme, n'est-ce pas, ce, la transition énergétique, si, eh bien, il ne recourt pas à d'autres moyens. Ben, une des pistes, parce qu'il faut dire que nous sommes un pays pauvre et les moyens ne sont pas là, mais une des pistes qui sont envisagées, qui sont possibles, c'est le partenariat, euh, envisagé par l'État, c'est le partenariat public-privé. Il y a d'ailleurs dans notre pays une loi sur le partenariat public-privé qui a été voté à l'Assemblée nationale. Et cette loi, n'est-ce pas, c'est déjà expérimenté dans le secteur, le secteur routier. Hein, le, 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 le Bénin n'a rien pas les moyens, il concède aux sociétés privées hein, de construction des routes, n'est-ce pas, les possibilités de faire le travail. Et donc, et ça marche relativement bien. Ça marche relativement bien, même si on doit dire que c'est un endettement pour le pays, un endettement qu'il faut reconnaître pour le pays. Et dans ce rôle, les syndicats doivent jouer leur partition. Parce qu'il faut reconnaître qu'aujourd'hui, la grande partie du pays, dans la, 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 les zones rurales, n'ont sont sans, 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 sont, sont, pas d'énergie, d'électricité. Et ce qu'on constate, c'est que nous, le Bénin est confronté à ce que vous savez, le terrorisme, hein, le djihadisme est dans notre pays. Et dans les zones les plus reculées, il n'y a pas l'électricité. Il n'y a, a pas la présence de l'État. Le problème de, de la lutte contre le terrorisme, ce n'est pas seulement les, les armes, c'est aussi la présence de l'État dans ces endroits reculés, dans la ruralité, et avec des, 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 des services publics, et les hôpitaux, n'est-ce pas, les écoles, etc. Mais pour ça, pour installer cela, les entreprises, les sociétés, les petites et moyennes sociétés, pour maintenir les gens, pour sentir que l'État est présent, mais pour que cela soit une réalité, il faut l'énergie, il faut l'électricité. Et donc, il est indispensable de travailler à aller dans cette direction. J'ai écouté tout à l'heure celui qui, celui qui a parlé et je, je, suis, je, prends, je, je suis partant pour cette proposition qu'il a faite, à savoir que euh, non seulement le partenariat public-privé peut être une piste, mais aussi le partenariat public-public est une bonne piste aussi. Une bonne piste parce que euh, nous avons les retraites chez nous au Bénin, les pensions de retraite, on a la Caisse nationale. C'est une surliquidité. Surliquidité de l'argent est là. Et donc, on peut exploiter cette piste. Moi, je pense que c'est une très bonne, très bonne piste qui nous a été suggérée tout à l'heure par l'intervenant que nous avons suivi euh, sur les écrans. Il y a donc un défi pour les syndicats de faire de telle sorte que, eh bien, dans cette, dans cette transition, que on ne... On ne l'électricité ne soit pas marchandisé et que des gens se retrouvent avec cela pour s'enrichir sur le dos des travailleurs. Pour cela, nous devons, même si nous ne sommes pas invités, invités ou pas invités, nous devons être dans un, dans un creuset, une coalition, une intersyndicale pour influencer, influencer les décisions qui vont être prises et aussi la même chose pour intersyndicats pour influencer, mais aussi travailler avec les, les autres, les acteurs de la société civile sur ce défi qui est un défi stratégique. Je vous remercie, bon, j'ai épuisé mon temps, je vous remercie pour l'écoute attentive. Merci bien et vive tu es. Merci.
Thank you very much, Comrade. And I think it's quite an important uh, moment for us. I think if we if we take this presentations that have been uh, that that have happened over the last two days, Sean, you made mention of how we're getting to groups. Um, and I think one would definitely be for countries who are on the pathway to making a decision, whether they go privatization or whether they actually choose the public pathway. I think there's lots of experience in this room in how to actually facilitate support and encourage the comrades in Benin, as well as the communities and the people there to actually fundamentally take the choice that's in the, in the direction of the public pathway. And I think there's lots of knowledge and support in this room that can do that. Thanks very much for your presentation. I now hand over to Kavanaugh from uh, Namibia, and then I'll give you last. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Mahongora Gabihua from Namibia, the Regional Congress of Namibia. Um, Namibia is a country we are um, acutely vulnerable in the sense that most of our energy, close to 71%, is being imported. It is imported from ESCOM, although they are in difficulty, at least they, they, they give 18% uh, lights and life in Namibia. Also from uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia. Zambia account for 32% and Zim account for 9%. Of course, the the producer is a state and it um, produces both from hydro and the coal, uh, coal um, producers are always on standby, it's not running 24 hours. And we also get um, some electricity from the Southern African uh, power pool of around 9% as well. Um, in order to light Namibia. However, beside the, the, the NAM power, we have what we call a regulatory body, which try to regulate prices. But of course, that body is also state appointed. And um, the influence of the companies in terms of regulating it the pricing, uh, there is very less public participation because recently they have even increased the, the bulk electricity um, kilowatts with 8%, but the justifications thereof was not shared, not with state union or public in general. However, on the distribution part, there are three companies that are also state that are the country is divided into three parts, North, Central, and West. So now this become a, a middleman. Um, it was uh, objected severely because when you introduce a middleman, it affects the consumer price. And I'm sure that we also, we also need to interrogate those kind of, um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, arrangement. Do we need to really to have a middleman? Uh, through the dismantling approach that is being created here and who will fit that bill and to what extent our members going to be affected. However, also there is a IPP uh, which also contribute 9% of electricity. Uh, 14 of them are solar and only one wind. But however, the question comes, can trade union participate in this? I'm sure that people are talking about the public, public, where they're mentioning about pension funding, you name, the list goes on. So do you want uh, the trade unions us to engage and also become a kind of uh, IPP? Uh, or what do you want us to do? Because these things, I mean, been, been, been unpacked. Uh, of course, the pension money is the workers money. It's not public money. But if we have to redirect our money to be reinvested in this kind of activities, is that the approach that we want? Or, or we need a different approach? Um, let me well down now, after the, a rough um, background of Namibia, I want to well down to the topic on the table, what can trade union do? Can we play a role or not moving forward? I think we can, because if we have seen the presentations here, we've seen that um, some, uh, I mean, producers, electrical producers, electricity producers 
are also cross-boating with other countries. So I think that we need to start encouraging bilateral agreement between trade unions so that we can start cooperating and start sharing information and research. Um, we also need to encourage this debate to be debated at the regional or sub-regional level so that we, because in SADC we have that uh, Southern African power pool and all those kind of things. But I think that trade union we can play a role there. The other intervention that we can play is how do we play, I mean, how do we play our role in terms of redirecting the economy? Because the most important things here is ideological. We have seen that um, the new graduates from our universities are thinking the West way. None of them think about human being. They think about that if any state have to give resources or assist the community or whoever, those communities are lazy. This is what they have been taught in the universities. How do we trickle down so that we can start playing, uh, influencing those graduates from early, I mean, I mean, early stage. I'm sure that the, all speakers, they talk about various books here, especially the last uh, moderator was quoting and underlining from various books. But are these books be taught to the young people? Mm -hmm. Or the, only the narrative that uh, when the state inter intervene, it means that those communities are poor. And the issues of taxations, does the money that the state spend only come from tax? Can we not now change the narrative where we can now start demanding that the, 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 the commodity that we are selling as our community and whatever come from us, it must be, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean reinvested uh, among ourselves. I like the approach of Botswana where they are talking to the beers now to share 50 50. How many of our countries have moved to that level? How many of our countries have convinced the governments to move that way? And that's why it was deliberate. The question that I asked from my learned daughter, whether the Uganda situation is because of old age or is a convict, I mean, it was convinced, I mean, I mean, he was con I mean, convinced. And the answer is that he was convinced. So I think that with the age come the wisdom of being, seeing the reality, not being ignorant to the reality. So that must be commended. And I'm sure that we have to push our governments moving forward. The governance issues came prominently. What kind, if you are saying that public, I mean, I mean public pathway. And we know that when we move public pathway, there is a problem of governance. What alternative can we provide a state union to governance? What are we saying? Have we research? Can we provide a model? Or we talk about public pathway so that the whatever parties in power they can enrich themselves and the life continue and the citizens suffer. So I think that we need to research on that. What kind of governance we want to see so that we ensure that the, the, our, our, our call for public pathway benefits the people, but not end up in the pocket of few from experience that we have experienced. The other one is the issues of the, 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 the taxes I mentioned about it, uh, the model of productions. What do we want? And that's what I, I raised earlier. We want this dismantling, or we want the same system that take us through to what we want to achieve, so that we can, I uh, mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, the uh, rescue the the, the 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 community in terms of paying the the consume, I mean, price. The other component is our our our, our strategic um, alliances with the like-minded universities. I'm sure that we have various um, uh, research institute, but have we, like in, if you go take an example of Brazil, there is a very, very vibrant university, University of Campinas. To what extent we approach them even for them to produce a counter attack, I mean, I mean documents to, to IMF or to, to, to World Bank or to any other, 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 other capitalist who are saying that to go public is always wrong. I'm sure they will help us to produce counter attack documents in those. Let me end there for now, then we can engage with the questions. Thank you very much. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, Carmen Carmen, because I think what you're doing is apart from just taking us forward, you're also really practically putting forward uh, suggestions and recommendations, and I think challenges to us as the unions. Yeah. I think although you're contextualizing it in terms of Namibia, I think there's a lot of uh, insights that you're providing that, that can speak to all of us. And I think that's a very positive note uh, and entry point for my comrade over here. Yeah. We thought I made him speak last for the wrong reason, but there you go. Right. Over to Comrade Tawana from Satao. No, thanks, Comrade Amira. Uh, my name is uh, Tawana Mopedi. I'm the 
Secretary Coordinator for the South African Transport and Allied Workers Union, uh, that is Satao. So I, before I go into this, you know, when I read the topic, I realized that the topic that we were talking about being uh, neoliberalism's effect, uh, efforts to undermine public energy in the global south, and some countries are taking measures to reclaim their power, and many are resisting to push uh, 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 the push to implement uh, energy privatization. You know, just reading that topic on its own, you realize that the topic has a lot of concepts, which those concepts in and of themselves are, uh, have their own contradictions. For an example, the first concept that came out was the concept of neoliberalism. Uh, talking about the self-regulating market. And we know that uh, the self-regulating market, what it has done was the market has imposed itself onto social relations where market is the one that dictates as opposed to social relations being in the forefront that dictate how markets should actually operate. That was the first uh, 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 problem with the self-regulating uh, market. Secondly, in South Africa, for an example, we've got state-owned enterprises such as your Transnet and ESCOMs. But you hear the name state-owned, but then we forget, uh, we forget to apply the unity and conflict of opposites of the concept of state-owned. Because in South Africa, a state-owned enterprise is a limited state-owned enterprise. It's delinked from society, and then it being delinked from society, it's privatized fully by the state, which is bourgeois in character, and imposes the very same market fundamentalist principles onto the very same society. So that is very fundamental on the nature of the state and it when it convinces us about this transition that is entering into and trying to mitigate crisis. It talks to us about public private partnerships, public equity partnerships. And now we hear your own state that is owned by the state, a state owned enterprise owned by the state telling us we have to privatize because of the mandate of the state. So that is a very big contradiction of the state-owned enterprise. And then it creates a, a, a nuance or a contradiction with, should we take, uh, when we renationalize, do we renationalize and take the state-owned, uh, that entity back to a bourgeois state, which itself is saying, no, we must self-cannibalize and actually uh, unbundle ourselves because we have to create enabling markets for the private sector. And uh, another concept that comes up, which is important, uh, we're talking about resisting uh, the push. Uh, again, that is a fundamental concept uh, uh, in our tradition, the concept of power and resistance. And power and resistance in economic and in, in non-economic institutions. But then what we have always done as labor in most cases, and when you read about labor, we, we, we read about labor changing external conditions. However, we forget on the question of resistance, resistance is a power relation and resistance, if it's not managed as a power relation can be destructive internally. So we do not speak about our self-criticism as the working class in approaching uh, uh, the current productive social and economic relations. And uh, because the concept is based on uh, uh, non uh, uh, power and resistance, uh, comes the question of the global North versus the global South again. It talks about the very same structures that are domestic, regional, global. But then when you look at these geopolitical contradictions, we then realize the contradictions between the North versus the South. And then when you come back to it, you realize, okay, uh, within the manner that we are working, the North remains as the metropole, the South becomes the satellite, and we con con uh, consistently exploit the periphery. That is what the National Development Plan says. We have to create enabling markets uh, within uh, uh, the African region for the private sector, which is pri uh, a private equity partner. I was actually shocked yesterday when I heard that the energy system in Uganda was actually privatized by ESCO, but then it's collapsing in South Africa. That's a big contradiction. Um, and then as being a trade union as well, because uh, I want to deal with trade union issues, uh, our productive and economic relations, our existence is located in productive, in productive relations. And then these productive relations, when you delve deep into the relationship uh, of labor, you realize that labor and nature always enter into a metabolic relationship where they have to contradict 
uh, uh, the natural resources and then create final products that actually must circulate and benefit us depending on the forms of production that are there, the type of political economy that is there. Now, we talk about social regulation versus market regulation. And social regulation, are we talking about the regulation where we produce for the purpose of use values? Or are we talking about market regulation where we produce for the purpose of exchange value to realize that surplus value? Where labor, money, and nature become fictitious commodities. This is why I like these discussions that we find ourselves here because you find labor grappling with the natural question. And it's where you find the correlation between labor, nature, and however, because of market regulation, money exists, conceals the social relation that labor plays in transforming society. So in most cases, when we talk about labor, it's outside of nature. When we talk about nature, it's outside of labor. And then there's money involved in it, and it conceals the part played by labor in transforming society. So it takes me to the question, you know, when I was looking at it and all of this, in respect social regulation, if it's market regulation, we are brought to the same question, the question of extractivism. Some of us, we are in denial of the question of extractivism. You don't want to extract. I remember in Cape Town, we said, hole in the hole, oil in the in the soil and you're simply saying no they must remain with them so labor must not enter into a relationship with them so how then do we produce uh do we go back when reality tells us we don't go back actually time is moving forward we can learn from the past and then negate the future so that is where it puts me well when we deal with that concept are we talking about planned economy are we talking about an unregulated economy that creates fictitious commodities such as labor, nature, and money. So we, we haven't grappled with that. As a matter of fact, in South Africa, when you look at it, we speak these countries, you know, planned economy. What is the planned economy? Is productive relations wrong, or are we going to move to what's a degree that is based on overproduction and un for the better good of society advanced by the working class. So, Komuit uh, 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 Hamida, before I conclude, I'm going to come to some of uh, uh, the recommendations we did, uh, especially now when uh, we talk about social regulation. Uh, me and my traditions, my, my politics, uh, because we are talking about the state. When we say social relations and we are talking about our relationship as the working class with the state, do we still talk about the concepts such as dictatorship of the proletariat, seizure of state control by the working class? Or are we simply saying no, status quo, bourgeois state, but institutions take proper mandate from the affiliates, not forgetting that that mandate is coming from the point of production from the working class. It is when we're talking about participatory forms of democracy. So their representatives in these institutions might not be getting the proper mandate and not getting the proper mandate. They too and those institutions that should be democratic run the risk of becoming oligarchic. Now, Two, we have to reimagine. Uh, 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 we also spoke about the need for local residential structures. Commodities circulate within uh, uh, communities. 
But trade unions today, we have moved away from our community role. We have separated from the community, but we are taking decisions for communities. We say we should localize, locally produce, but is it what that community is saying about its forms of production and economic relations? In most cases, no. We are talking from a theoretical perspective, delinked from what is happening in material reality. Now, we have to reimagine trade unionism. I think the pathway that we need right now, trade unionism has to be reimagined. The working class has fundamentally changed. Working class of the 1970s, 80s is different from the working class of today. The working class of today, when you look at it, they are career trade unionists. They are entrepreneurs located in the trade union movement. Our organizing strategies are not resonating with the very same workers. When you call workers meetings, workers do not attend because they feel they do not know what has been said about them. Hence, we need to uh, come up with more initiatives, deal with concepts of democracy, and fundamentally deal with us realizing a destination where we have theoretical leaders and practical leaders as well. So when we merge, theory and practice, we can have solutions that actually transform society. I'll pause there. Thank you very much, Comrade Tawana. I think those were absolutely powerful words on which to close the session, or this part of the session. I think if there was ever uh, a misconception that there's a dearth of knowledge, articulation, and real analysis of what we confronted with as the trade union movement, I think he is a young comrade, very, very militant, very, very powerful, very passionate and absolutely articulate in relation to the real challenges. And I think if we're wanting to take forward this particular pathway, I think not only does he present uh, the challenges for us as the labor movement vis-a-vis -vis capital, but also fundamentally uh, in terms of our own need for introspection and how it is that we take up the challenges confronting us if we are to take the leading role uh, to contest the hegemony that we confront with and really lead uh, towards a, a, a public pathway. So with that, thank you very much. Um, lunch, I think, is almost served. And I think we will wait for the conveners to then engage us in relation to what happens after lunch. Thank you very much. Thanks for, oops, sorry. Thanks very much, comrades. Um, a couple announcements. Uh, so lunch is being served now and we should get there quickly because uh, there's another um, group here that we're going to be competing with. So we want to get there before they do. Um, and that's how it's timed right now. Um, and because we're running late, anyways, um, you know what I mean. Um, the other thing is that there is going to be a group photo after lunch. So please uh, get back here at 1.45 at the end of lunch so we can take that group photo together. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>